And we are live. Welcome to Fantastic Fiction at KGB. This is our 12th month doing oh it online. Isn't that crazy? Uh, 12, 12 months, a whole year doing this uh, online since we uh, moved from the KGB bar uh, to YouTube. So, uh, wow, that was a, a long year, but also really quick mm -hmm. year. Uh, but but anyway, tonight's guests, yes, uh, we have Shweta Thakrar and Kathleen Jennings uh, joining us from the States and Australia. So welcome, welcome to our reading. Um, Should I show off the, uh, I'm, I'm going to show yeah, off. Yeah, Ellen, what do you got there, Ellen? We received a book today from Tartarus Press, and it's by, um, it's by uh, Angela Slater, but it turns out Oops. It's illustrated by Kathleen Jennings, nice. and it's got illustration inside. I'll show it. Uh, I'm sorry, it's bad. I have to remember stage right and stage left. It's got spot illustrations, but Kathleen said, take off the cover and see what it looks like underneath. And look at this. It's gorgeous. Oh, it's beautiful. Isn't that beautiful? That's the cover underneath the dust jacket. Is it shiny? I can't tell. <laughs> but no, that is awesome. really gorgeous. What a, and poor Kathleen has not gotten her copy yet. She will. <laughs> it's a long way from England. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's longer from yeah to you than me. I don't know what so, it was. Kathleen is you're drinking coffee, right? I am drinking coffee because it's nearly ten in the morning. Ten in the morning, <laughs> yeah. And I'm drinking Emma Coffee? No, this is. <laughs> no, this I'm is, drinking uh, an imperial I'm, stout from Evil Twin. A seltzer that's grapefruit tinged, but not much. <laughs> mm. Well, my mug is a Diana Wynne Jones Fire and Hemlock themed mug by Emma Falconer. Oh, nice. very appropriate. Very we're nice. showing off illustrations. Uh -huh. <laughs> <laughs> Hello, Joseph. Hello. Hello, Joseph. Hello, Victoria. Welcome. Welcome. Yeah, so if you're joining us uh, for the first time, this is a fantastic fiction at KGB reading series. Uh, Ellen Datlow and I uh, have been hosting the series for a long time. The series has been going since the late 90s. Usually it's at the KGB bar in Manhattan, but because of the lockdown, we are now doing it on YouTube. And uh, once we go back, hopefully we're gonna go back at some point, um, we're gonna continue the live streams somehow. I uh, have to figure out exactly what we're going to do. Um, might want to just record it and edit it. Otherwise, you're going to get a lot of like people chatting and talking and running around. Uh, yeah. <laughs> what? And yelling. <laughs> and yelling and things like that. But uh, but yeah. But um, hi, Carol. For us. hi, Carol. Hi, Chris. And Stephanie. And Hello. Sam. Hi, Stephanie. Oh, see now. Now it's warm. I need my air conditioner on. <laughs> my fan. It suddenly got air really warm. in the middle of the summer. Um, I, what's the best part? Chris says something's the best part. Yeah. Hi, so, uh, the if you want to support the fantastic fiction Hi, the reading series, there's a link at the bottom of your screen. There, um, we uh, we give a stipend to the readers. We uh, we have to pay for the hosting services and the streaming services, and. Um, we uh, give money to the KGB bar every month to support them, to keep them running. So if you can uh, throw us a couple bucks, we'd, we'd be super appreciative. Uh, also, the KGB bar uh, themselves, um, you know, it's a great um, bar in the Lower East Side of Manhattan, literary bar. There's uh, literary venues almost every night. Um, if you can uh, send them, you know, a couple bucks if you can, if you, if, yeah, if you want to. I'm not sure if they're, I can't tell if they're open or not. I mean, Lori. I think they're open with limited capacity. Yeah, but um, I can't imagine or, anyone choosing to go to a bar right now. Well, you know, I um, Dan, the bartender Dan, yeah. told us that um, a lot of um, cooks and chefs w would go to the bar um, after work because I they mean, were- now? I mean, even now? With, with well, now I don't know, but I mean, I think it was known as a place to go late at night, you know? Oh, I know, but nothing's open late at night anymore. That's a good point. So I don't know. <laughs> I don't know who's going there. Um, but you know, Lori said that they're open at partial capacity. 
Um, what, uh, what would Lori? Yeah, I know. She just kind. Yeah, right. Mm. Yes. Hi guys. People. More people are joining hey, us. Oh, it says they're open on a uh, Twitter. Says they're open till ten p.m. tonight. Cool. Oh, I think you should probably start the video when you're live streaming by having like having a camera go through the bar, past the bar where everyone's ordering to get the full experience. Because my book club was all online, but now that we're able to meet in person, some people still zoom in, and we have to carry the laptop past the table with all the cake and coffee on it for the first ten minutes. I do have a shot of the bar here. I'm going to put it up on the screen. This is a shot of the bar. Um, mm -hmm. the, you can see the statue of Lenin there, and and the the bottles and stuff like that. It's it's really a great bar. I mean, if it you, is. Uh, it's got a lot of atmosphere. Yeah. yeah. It has a great atmosphere. I used to hate bars until they stopped smoking, and then they're actually not so bad to be in. I mean, I wouldn't want to go in because I would die, like, from the, you know, the smoke. But now. Oh, they would give me headaches. Oh, yeah. yeah. Now it's kind of yeah. cool. Hi, David. Hi, David. Um, yes, there's a lot of conversations going on in the chat when I'm trying to keep up. I've uh, never seen so many lights on there. In the bar? You mean the picture of the bar? Oh, when you mean on the bar. Wait, now I have to look at the picture again. What lights? <laughs> mean? Oh, yeah. No, yeah, because it's usually really super dim. Did, there. The picture? did you take it from their site or something? Or did you... No, I think Are I took that. I don't know. It was probably, you know, it was probably a flash from my camera. You should though, right? distribute KGB bar backgrounds for video conferencing. <laughs> There is. I think there is. I mean, if you, you just can download it, and you, um, you can download any picture for for Zoom. I believe. Yeah. I mean, you, you can download your own. So presumably, if there's a picture on a website or someplace, you can download it and use it. Except I think, actually, actually, um, Lori, hi Amy, sent me um, a picture of the podium just for that purpose. Oh. Which reminds me, I need to send her something. Oh. Oh, and I should. Sorry, it's completely separate. Go ahead. I, I was just going to say, whenever I refer to being out and about and doing stuff, I'm not being unsafe. I'm in Brisbane, Queensland. We're allowed to go out. We're just not allowed to go anywhere else. <laughs> so, yeah. So I'm not encouraging unsafe behaviour. Just not in. Not near you. <laughs> not yet. No. <laughs> Yeah, I haven't. Well, my my extent of going out is in going food shopping, and yeah, that's pretty much it. Yeah, early on, I actually went with my hair um, start uh, colorist, but I, but then it got more nervous, nerve wracking. You know, initially it was like for a while, it was, I felt comfortable, and then I didn't. So I have to talk to her. I get my second shot in a in March, early March, like March eighth, and I think I'll want to if they're open. I assume they are. I'll go to her after that because you know I just I'm doing it myself is a pain in the neck. I mean, it was only like you know, it's not like a permanent thing when you do it with a rinse, and I did it in my kitchen, which was better because it has a metal sink but it's, it's like oh i don't want to do this i want someone to do it for me <laughs> yeah and it's like eh. so it's been weird you know the top is still is dark brown so obviously i haven't gone gray and then the sides are all magenta <laughs> the trouble is once you can be out and about again you suddenly have to worry about what the back of your hair looks like i never look at so the back of my head i never <laughs> look at the back of my hair <laughs> i actually cut my hair i couldn't stand it anymore and i just did and I think the curls will hide a multitude of sins for at least for a while. Yeah. So, you know, so it's like, I can live with it this way. I think everyone's <laughs> hair sins will be forgiven. <laughs> yeah. 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 I'm trying to get a good close up look at Shreta's um, book, bookcases. All right. I'm going to solo you, Shreta. Here we go. <laughs> All steady. All right. Should I, should I, should I duck out of here? <laughs> oh, there's your book there. Is that a bad fairies book? Oh, Maybe. cool. Yes. And then, yeah. What's, so. ooh, what's, what? I won't go down lower because I have it messy me of piles of books on the floor. But. My place, my book. My a stuff. little bit with all the dolls and stuff. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That looks great. So, cool. um, yeah, I guess I didn't realize. I guess it flips it left to right or something. I don't know. Maybe I'm... What, you flipped it? You were able to flip it? You didn't No, that? I mean, Shweta, like, it looked like your book cover was backwards, but... Oh, is it? Hold on. It only looks it only looks backwards on your own screen. So we we are sort of seeing it in like 
one sees one's own screen in mirror image, but everyone else can see it the correct well, way around. When I did this, it was right, wasn't it? It's yeah, correct. Yeah, you can see it right. Right. Oh, maybe, yeah. I, maybe I didn't, maybe it was far away and I just mm. looked at it wrong or something. But uh, great book corner for Zooming. Yeah, yeah, it, yeah. Linda Addison says, yeah, it is great. Um, you know, I was saying before we were live that, you know, my bookshelves are in the corners. So like in order, in order to have like a cool background, I'd have to like sit with, you know, I, I just... So I, I either have either have like this mine bookshelves like wall or a closet. <laughs> no more will my bookshelves surround me. Thank God. <laughs> I'm trying well, to. Let me, I'm let trying me just to say. organize my bookcases. <laughs> no, go on, Trina. Oh, I was just gonna say. Let me just say that uh, you know I had so my my novel my debut novel which came out last year right like I had so been looking forward to having a an in person party at a store. <laughs> It ends up being in front of my bookcases. So, well, you can when when this is all over, you can have another book party, and we will yes. all be there. I would be there. Would you? Oh, was it going you. to be in 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 the metro area in the New York City area? Yeah, I was thinking Books of Wonder. Oh, cool. Yeah, we yeah. did end up virtually hosting, which was kind of so. yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, I do. I am, in fact, in a corner of bookcases, but the one immediately behind the screen is all my <laughs> my very old CD collection. And mm -hmm. every so often, I get shamefaced about not having updated it and have to hide it from public view. <laughs> <laughs> Wait, shamefaced for having old CDs? I mean, do you? No, it's just not at all. Except it's just a very specific snapshot of a specific time in my life <laughs> when all the CDs. So. Yeah, yes. I mean, you're back and forth on whether I'm I want capsule. to share that with the world. <laughs> yes. I mean, do you still buy CDs? Because most of the time, if I buy when I buy music, it's MP3s. I don't really buy. I, I still buy CDs, but not I do. Them. I still buy CDs. You do? Okay. I'm wanting to buy them again, but at the moment, I don't have a CD player anymore because I always used to use my laptop. But I'm mm -hmm. setting up a, more of a working studio space, so I'm actually really looking forward to getting a little CD player in there and just. Well, I was able to get rid of most of, not most, but a lot of my CDs. I moved. I mean, hundreds, but I still have a, a lot. <laughs> I mean, but now they all fit in my armoire. Before I used to have them in my armoire and I had them, the, the, the shelf behind me was a CD holder. And I had another one in my bedroom that was another CD holder, but now I can use them for knickknacks and other things. Does it feel like, like home now? Like, have you lived there long enough where it feels like home? Well, yes, except I still have a mess <laughs> in yeah. my living room. You know, um, yes, it feels like home. And uh, that's how you know it feels like home is if there's a mess, if it's <laughs> like a hotel room. Maybe it is the best that we start, you know? I mean, I have, I don't feel I can get rid of the mess until I get at least the one display case to move things around. But I need to, I may put to stuff everything in the closet. I've been putting some things in the closet. I have a lot of closets. <clears throat> so I put the rest of the cart, the uh, bags in the closet. At least I won't see them. It'll look like I have a home. But I also have my art surrounding me. I have all these art frames and for art, mostly so that I can figure out, every once in a while I'm inspired. It's like, oh, I know where I'm going to put that. I can't put anything in my living room, but I, in my bedroom I can put stuff. And um, so, you know, I, I kind of ha I'm surrounded by different all kinds of art that I haven't put up yet. And once in a while, I will figure out where I'm going to put something. <laughs> <You know? clears throat> so, but it's kind of weird with all the arts on the floor. <laughs> mm, yeah. well, that's the trouble is the bookshelves and bookshelves and art both require wall space. So it's yeah. a constant battle. Well, my bookshelves, I mean, I managed to unpack my books and get them on shelves. That was the first thing I did. I do not have, well, I have the only books I have lying around are the ones for the year's best, either that I'm supposed to read for this year and a pile for next year that I don't have room for on the bookshelf yet back there because I still have that pile from this year. Um, but most of my books are, are shelved, which is like, oh, my gosh. You know, I will not let books lie, pile up in the floor like I did in my old apartment in that back room, which was basically a, a depository for books and stuff. And was not used for anything in it. You can barely get in there. So I don't have a room like that. Now I have closets. <laughs> well, I've almost sorted my way through last year's books, world fantasy reading book, award reading books, mm -hmm. and I'm down to the Alaya, which seems to be composed mostly of aviation history for some reason. I'm not getting rid of those. <laughs> uh, okay, yeah. 
I mean, I decided I'm going to put a piece of art in my, I have a walk-in closet now, and I'm going to put a piece of art in there. When I walk in, I see it all the time. And I think that's a really cool place to put a big piece of art. So that's what I'm going to do. The Folio Society illustration competition a year or two ago was for How's Moving Castle. And I mm -hmm. got together with some friends just to go through all the entries when they went up online. And none of us had got our act together to enter. So we were like critiquing and judging and passing <laughs> comment. We had no skin in the game. It was great. And we came across these gorgeous screen printed illustrations and ended up contacting the artist. She didn't win, but contacted the artist and a couple of us bought all her artist proofs off her. So I'm in the process of getting those framed. And yeah. then I have to work out where to put them. Or actually, maybe I actually have a Tom Canty. Uh, he did. I he gave me the the cover of the first year's best fantasy and horror of year's best fantasy cover, and I haven't had it hanging for a long time. And maybe I think that will fit in my in my walk-in closet. I think in that way I can see it all the time. Every time I dress, <laughs> so I may put that in there. I guess it's um, it's time actually to start. Yeah. Hi, Mike. <laughs> Hello, everyone. So, uh, yeah, thanks for thanks for joining. Oh, Chris Dykeman mm -hmm. forced me to get rid of my forty fives. Well, I had, I had well, you didn't have a record player. That's what she pointed out. <laughs> 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 but I, but they were my favorite records. My you could have sold them. You could have sold them. The oh, I know. At that yeah. point, I wanted to get rid of everything. I mean, I'd gone. We had gone to the the thrift store many times. Just yeah. At that point, it was like get everything out of the house and put yeah. it. Yeah. No, I sold a lot of record albums at one time and, you know, got chunks of money for that. And my CDs I got a lot of money for. Anyway, okay. <laughs> All yes, <right>. Chris. <laughs> yes, Chris is a monster. You made me get rid of, but you also threw out all my um, plastic <laughs> containers. So I have to <laughs> <laughs> I'm just starting to get Alan, you're my favorite. All right, well, well, you guys can take this, this offline. We, we want to focus on our guests tonight. Um, <laughs> So, uh, yeah, if you're just tuning in, uh, this is the Fantastic Fiction at KGB Reading Series. Uh, this is a monthly series hosted by Ellen Datlow and myself. Um, we have readings on the third Wednesday of every month. We've been doing this. Well, the series has been going since late um, 99. Um, and uh, read you a little history about it. So basically, um, Terry Bisson and Alice K. Turner started the series uh, in the late 90s, attempting to bring together mainstream writers with writers of speculative fiction. Um, but uh, we were mostly now just speculative fiction. Uh, in the spring of 2000, uh, mixed kind of. Ellen, what's that? We have some people who do mixed stuff occasionally. Exactly. Uh, in the spring of 2000, um, Ellen Datlow took over for Alice Turner, and in August 2002, uh, Gavin Grant uh, stepped in for Terry Bisson when he moved to California, and uh, I stepped in for Gavin in 2008. So um, since the lockdown, for six years. I'm sorry. Wait, Gavin did it for six years. According to my logs, yeah. Well, Gavin and Kelly did it together. So. No, he did it. Well, I mean, she didn't introduce anyone. He did it, but they moved. Then I don't know how long before they moved to Massachusetts. Okay. But he commuted for like two years, a year, which was like bad. <laughs> you know? Sorry. Uh, but yeah, no, so the series, so um, as I said uh, earlier, this is our 12th month doing streaming. This is crazy. So like uh, when we did the, when the lockdown happened, uh, we were just like, well, what are we going to do? And, and uh, we said, hey, you know, let's, let's try this online thing. Let's try the streaming thing. And um we found this tool called StreamYard. It works really well. We stream right to YouTube. We've been getting lots of views. We get, and uh, the best part is we, we get to have guests from all over the world, right? So uh, Even is five joining us all the way from Australia and uh, yeah. Shweta's joining us from all the way in uh, New Jersey. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I mean, um, last month we had Usman Malik from uh, Pakistan. Uh, we've had Benjamin Rosenbaum from Switzerland. Lauren and, Bukes from uh, South Africa. South Africa, thank you. Yeah, Lauren uh, Bukes and and uh, yeah, so, and uh, not only our guests, but you guys watching, you can watch them all over the world live. So mm -hmm. um, our readers um, are gonna read for 20, 25 minutes each. And then uh, after both readings, 
we're going to do a Q&A. So if you have questions you'd like to ask them, uh, think of them now. You can put them in the uh, Google, uh, the YouTube live chat, and uh, we'll uh, hopefully get to ask them those questions. So um, yeah, oh, so just a uh, quick, quick notice about the series itself. So um, we do, um, as I said a, a little bit earlier, um, it does cost a little bit of money to keep the series going. Um, we give the readers a stipend. Uh, we pay for the streaming and hosting services. We give the KGB bar money every month. When we were doing the live readings, we would take you guys out to dinner. So I'm sorry, we cannot we take you out to dinner. One day. Uh, that's you always are, fun because then are. we get to chat and we hear all the gossip about the writing world. And, <laughs> um, you know, but uh, yeah, so uh, it does cost us a little bit of money to keep the series going. If you can um, support us, great. Uh, there's a link there. Um, if not, no worries. Um, and then the the bar itself, the KGB bar um, that hosts us, um, it's this great literary bar in East Village of Manhattan. Um, you know, there's uh, reading, literary events, poetry events, things like that, almost every night of the week. Um, they're a great bar. We want to keep them going, you know, through the pandemic and after. If you can... Uh, throw them a couple of bucks uh, to, you know, um, cost of a, a drink hard or soft to help them out. Uh, there's a link right there and in the YouTube description. But yeah, so um, let's get on to our readers tonight. So I'm excited because I discovered that I can do cool things. Like I can do this. Wait, <laughs> here we go. So uh, here's Sh uh, Schwetz's book, uh, Star Daughter. So you should check that out. Let me see if I can throw up the banner here at the same time. Um, there we go. Uh, the, the link's there if you want to uh, check out her book. Um, URL at the bottom, again, in the YouTube uh, description, the video description. And then um, here's Kathleen's book as well. So uh, go ahead and check that out. I think the covers of both of them are really great. So, yes. Yeah. Um, all right. So let me just get rid of this. There we go. All right. So um, Kathleen is going to be reading first. And uh, Kathleen Jennings is a writer and illustrator from Australia. In 2020, her debut illustrated novella, Fly Away, which I just showed, was published by Tor.com. And her debut poetry collection, Travelogues, Vignettes from Trains in Motion, was published by Brain Jar Press. I love that name. Her short stories have been published by Tor.com, Lady Churchill's Rosebud Wristlet, and Strange Horizons, among others. She's currently working on a PhD about contracts in fantasy novels. Welcome, Kathleen Jennings. Hello, thank you so much for having me. This is really thrilling to be here. And hello from Brisbane, where it is morning and I have a very interesting drink of coffee. <laughs> so I'm going to read a bit from Fly Away. This is actually the Australian edition, but it's exactly the same words inside. And it's the chapter called The Sawmill. Once there was a boy called, let's say he was called Jack. Boys in fairy tales always are. 12 years old and too small for it. Certain the world was withholding something. Burned to freckles, except for his feet inside his boots and his skinny chest beneath his shirt, pale as a fish belly. His dad was a contractor. They moved about, but he had lived around Inglewell all his life. And if he'd paid more attention to the stories he'd heard, he'd have known better. His old uncle, well, not precisely an uncle, but a cousin of sorts, knocked on the door of the caravan one day. This was just before Jack's mum inherited some land. Jack, he said furtively, I've got a job for you. Jack's mother would have asked, Davy Spicer, is this something dangerous? Although she was born a Spicer, she didn't approve of Uncle Davy, but she was working at the library. There used to be one at Carter's Crossing on Tuesdays. So Jack asked, how much? As much as you're worth, said his uncle, get down here. Jack jumped into the long grass around the caravan. His uncle cuffed the back of his head, not quite affectionately, and they climbed into Uncle Davy's low-slung Holden Kingswood WB, the best ute in the world. It was a long drive, but where isn't? They went by back roads and across paddocks. Jack climbed up and down, opening sagging wire gates. His uncle said, just leave them, they're no friends of ours. But Jack knew that much about the world. 
He levered each one closed again. They ran out of tracks. Wattle saplings whipped the ute's bull bar, dragged under and sprang up again. Then Uncle Davy stopped at a fence, properly built, with a metal gate in it. On the other side, tangled with glittering box and old iron bark, was a crowd of cypress pines, dark save for the blue-green buds of their pine cones. There was a dent in the trees that might have been the start of a track. Get on with it, said his uncle. Jack dropped into the wire grass and waded to the gate. It was tall as he was, latched with a chain and a metal hook, rusted tight but not locked. He had to shoulder it open against the clawing cotton bush, bracing into the bars and pushing with his legs straight. His uncle drove through and Jack closed it again, fumbling with the chain. The cypress pines pressed pungent against the windows and shrieked over the top of the ute, hissing and rattling along the way. Once, Jack and his uncle had to drag a fallen tree clear of their path. Then the way opened into weeds and cotton bush. They were at the end of the track. Jack's uncle killed the engine. In front of them, there had once been several small huts. Their timbers were grey and splintered, corrugated roofs corroded and folded in, porches sagging. A shed had collapsed over flakes of orange rust. What is it? asked Jack. Sawmill, said his uncle. Was. He gestured to a length of track. An iron trolley propped up one end of the fallen roof. What are we going to do? His uncle pointed toward the third hut. You, he said, are going in there to fetch out what you find. Why me? asked Jack. Because you're a skinny runt and the floors are rotten, said his uncle. There'll be a box of old glass bottles. He tossed his pocket knife to Jack. Make it snappy. I'll be waiting. The steps creaked and cracked. Something rustled hurriedly under them. Get on with it, said his uncle. He isn't close family, Jack reminded himself. Probably there were snakes in the hut, definitely below it. The splintered boards of the narrow porch gaped under his boots. When he grabbed one of the posts, the roof shifted. His uncle laughed, a sharp bark. Jack, straightening, trod carefully where nails bled rust onto the planks and hoped the beams were solid. The door hung at an angle from a hinge of riveted leather. The lower one had been gnawed through. Jack eased it open and edged into the hut. The darkness surprised him. Hot slivers of blue sky were bright through gaps in the roof and blades of shining dust floated between the boards over the window. But even with the door ajar, the light didn't get far. Well, called his uncle, can you see it? It's dark, shouted Jack. The ceiling creaked like footsteps. He lowered his voice and hissed over his shoulder. I can't see. Air brushed his face. Air or spiders. He heard his uncle tramping through the grass. Jack, just inside the door, waited for his eyes to adjust. Slumped shadows, cushions hanging heavy with rot. Oddly, he could not smell mice, only mouldy cloth, dry wood, and beneath that a stale draught rising through the floorboards, damply cold on his shins. Weren't there stories about sinkholes and caves? He shifted his foot. Something light sifted between the planks, splinters perhaps, or leaves. He didn't hear it hit anything. Even if the ground was only half a metre beneath him, he wouldn't hear a leaf hit it. But the possibility that the ground was just maybe far, far more than a metre away kept him motionless until his uncle tramped back and rolled a torch across the porch and through the door. It drummed on the floor, loud as the beating of Jack's heart in his ears. I want to come out, Jack said. Get the bottles first, said his uncle. Jack turned, but his uncle had stepped onto the porch. He pushed the door shut and Jack couldn't find a handle. He hammered on the timber. I should have known you'd be a coward, said his uncle. Shut that racket or you'll bring the whole place down. Something slid off the roof and crashed into the grass. Jack found the torch and switched it on. He was in a small square room crowded with discarded boxes. The closest were cardboard. Their corners had swollen and split, spilling toys onto the floor, faded plastic trucks and bald baby dolls with naked cotton bodies. They smelled bad and shivered in the torchlight. Jack edged his way between them into the centre of the hut. Why was this stuff so important anyway? It wasn't antiques, just trash someone hadn't bothered taking to the tip. 
With the knife, he levered opened a lid. Only paper gnawed to lace. Silverfish scattered grey in the light. Visit the sunshine, read part of a yellowed newspaper on a flashish parcel. Jack prodded it. A plate. A sagging, narrow mattress, badly stained. Boxes labelled in marker that had run in purplish brown streaks. Tax plus rain gauge, said one, but only had empty photo albums in it. Another read, dress ups. Masking tape peeled off the cardboard like bark. Three hollow sided vinyl suitcases. Tools, fence strainers, and old saws, which he understood, and others he didn't. The saw was still sharp. He touched it and brought away a bead of blood on his hand. What about tetanus? His mother would say. Did you even think about tetanus? He sucked at the cut. Jack, I'm looking. But there, on the far side of the room, on a rickety rocking chair, its legs held together with twisted cord, was a box of bottles. They were not beer bottles or Coke bottles or even wine flagons. They were all much smaller and much older. Their edges were blurred and their sides were milky. Green and amber and deep midnight blue with ink or poison or names pressing up out of the glass itself. I've found it, said Jack. The bottom of the box sagged dangerously. He had to balance the torch on top of the bottles under his chin. The floor was a pool of shadow. He couldn't see if he was stepping on top of the beams. Hurry up, called Uncle Davy. Although there were cracks in the walls and door, he sounded a long way away. I am, grated Jack. Then a floorboard broke and his foot went through. Maybe he didn't hear the board fall because it hit the ground when the box hit the floor, and maybe it just kept falling. Short as he was, the hut wasn't that high. He should have touched dirt with the toe of his boot, but it swung loose, and his leg was caught between the planks well above his knee. Jack's heart was beating so loud he couldn't hear his uncle. He could barely hear the clatter of bottles rolling round him. His only thought was to get his leg clear of whatever was beneath the house. When he was free and could breathe again, Jack looked for the bottles. They were small enough and had spilled low enough that most were unbroken. He swept them together, away from the cold velvet space in the floor. The bottom of the box had torn through, so he pulled off his shirt and filled that. Then he reached for the torch. It rolled from his hand, flickering, tilted a moment on the edge of the hole, and fell. It spun down into blackness, flashing as it twisted. Then it struck something, and the light stopped. But the echoes kept going, like a heartbeat. Jack was cold with sweat. He scrambled through the dark, felt for his shirt, knocked a small hard thing that rolled another bottle, grabbed that too and backed away from the broken floor. He groped his way to the mouldering mattress, climbed it and pulled at the boards over the window. They came loose almost at once. The sky was so bright it stung tears into Jack's eyes. The dark pines were glowing red smudges. His uncle was a skeletal shadow. You'd be late for your own funeral, said Uncle Davy. Where's the box? It broke, said Jack. He held the clanking bundle of his shirt down. The, do the floor broke. I dropped the torch. His leg throbbed dully. I think I cut myself. Idiot, said Uncle Davy, turning back towards the ute. He had taken the shirt full of bottles and his pocket knife. Jack crouched on top of the mattress, judging the distance from the window to the ground. The front of his leg was cold. When he touched it, his hand came away red. He heard the ute's engine start. Wait, he shouted, his fear of crossing the floor of the hut evaporating. Wait for me! He jumped. He landed on hands and feet, jarring all his joints, and sprawled a moment in the hot sand, glad to feel the sun on his back. No dark at all, no dank chill. But Uncle Davy had turned the ute. Jack leapt up and galloped after it, hopping at times to spare his leg, but the ute pulled out in a shower of leaves, as if something swifter than the limping boy was after it. It pushed into the broken trees and roared off. At the edge of the pines, where the air was sticky with the smell of rosin, Jack bent, gasping for air, then turned. The light was golden around the sawmill. He half expected the buildings to have fallen into the earth, but they squatted, broken and unwelcoming. His leg hurt, sand caked with the seeping blood, and one foot was bare. His chest was bruised, and his leg too. He rubbed it, and felt the bottle still in his pocket. In the warm light, the glass was dull but it wasn't empty. It had a chalky silver lid, and when he shook it next to his ear, it made a sandy whisper. 
It had words on it too, like the poison bottles, but this one said farrier something. Part of a paper label clung to it. Ud for beast and ma. On the other side of the bottle was a lump in the glass, a skull and crossbones. Even better than poison, not food for beast then. He'd take it to school. Even the teachers would be interested. The historical house might want it. Maybe it would be valuable. And Mr. Alleman would interview him for the star. Jack squatted on his heels in the sparse, sharp grass near the trees, waiting for his uncle to return. Evening was arriving. The light grew richer, the trees behind him darker. It would be smart to stay at the sawmill, but he didn't want to be near that deep, black emptiness. Long leaves trailed over Jack's bare shoulders as he limped down the track, like spiders and ticks crawling over him, however much he tried to shrug the feeling off. Branches cracked in the twig-misted depths of the overgrown pine plantation. Then a roo drummed the ground, and it was silent again. Jack fidgeted with the bottle warm beneath his fingers. Maybe no one remembered the sawmill was there, and no one would look for him. But there had to be a real road nearby. Once, trucks would have carted the timber away. Or maybe his uncle was waiting at the gate, laughing. Jack pulled out the bottle. Its contents glittered and shifted like dust. Gold dust. Water would be more use. He wondered how long it would take him to walk home. If it was gold, maybe they could settle near town, live in a real house like his grandparents, although theirs was in Woodwild, practically a ghost town. Like Uncle Davy, although his was the old Spicer place. Jack opened the bottle. It wasn't gold. It rose, glittering like bubbles in lemonade, up into the thin bars of evening sun, slow and deliberate. Jack clapped his hand over the bottle. Instantly, the stuff puffed up like flour. It scratched in his throat and lungs and brain. When he stopped sneezing, the air was clear except for the haze of dusk. A little dust remained in the bottle. Jack screwed the lid back and put the bottle in his pocket. He did not feel sick, but he heard the drumming again, his heart thundering, the blood in his ears like marching feet, and along his spine, a certainty of deep, cold darkness under the earth. He spun around. Nothing but trees and, nearby, the sawmill. Night hurried through the pines. Limping on, Jack tried to think of anything but darkness. Instead, he thought of the glittering dust, the prickling in the back of his mind, of gold and the wishes it would have made come true, of the books his mum brought home from the library, the stories his grandmother told, strange bottles and wishes. I wish, he began. Something startled crashed through the trees. I wish, he said loudly, that we had a real house with bookcases for mum, he amended quickly. Jack's uncle had a fancy old bookcase that locked, full of outdated almanacs, Reader's Digest condensed books, and older volumes turned backs to the wall with marbling on the edges of their pages. Library books, wrapped in plastic, fastened with yellowing sticky tape, smelled peculiar. The sky was gold, then pink, then pale as new wood, but among the trees, night already curled around him like smoke. Jack walked as loudly as he could, missing one boot, to frighten off anything in the shadows. He was 12, and small as he was, there wasn't anything bigger than him in the trees that hadn't been brought from England. But his grandmother told him terrible things, and his mum had read in The Hound of the Baskervilles once. He'd never been entirely comfortable with the night since, especially when he heard... He paused on one foot to pick bindies from the bare one and listened. Nothing howled. Nothing at all. I wish, he said loudly and paused. He was going to say, I wish my friends were here, but he didn't have many. The bottle might fix that. So would having a real house. So he wished for friends, mumbling it in case something in the trees laughed at him or his uncle, waiting nearby, heard. Jack thought hard about the third wish. Wishing for a million dollars never ended well in books, and this might be his last wish if he got any at all. He could wish for a truck of his own and leave this awful place but the fun of thinking about wishes had worn off. He was almost sick with tiredness and fury and the lingering fright of falling. Mostly, although he wasn't sure later whether he said it aloud or if that even mattered, he wished his uncle could get as big a fright as he had, or worse. Jack fought his way out of the cypress forest. The air was silver grey and he heaved himself over the old gate to stagger in the sharp, night-bright grass on the other side. His bare foot was sore. The climb had broken up the scabbing blood on his leg, 
and his mum would be worrying. Jack tried not to feel sorry for himself. He'd heard old Pinnocky when he was young had been rolled on by a horse and dragged himself through the bush for three days until he found help. Never been the same since, of course, the story had ended, which was hardly comforting. Besides, Jack couldn't imagine old Pinnocky ever having been young. Odd, he realised belatedly, that after all Uncle Davy's complaining, his uncle had paused to shut the gate. Ahead, faint in the moonlight, were two fading lines where the youth's tyres had brought them across the paddock. He could track them back, he'd read about trackers, or he looked down at the dirt and along the fence on each side. There had been a fire break there once, wide as a track, although it hadn't been kept up, the fencer in Jack disapproved, and he could see a broken bush where his uncle must have turned the ute aside, leaving. That would be his way to the road. Pleased with himself, Jack jog limped along, ignoring the sounds of the night, which seemed louder there than they had in the pines. Just the wind hissing in the grass, birds shifting in the saplings, paddy melons leaving their tussocks for the night, a distant thumping, trucks on a rough road or a pump, not his heart, too metallic. He would have missed Dave Spicer's ute if it weren't for the smell of oil and rubber acrid on the cool breeze. It had plunged into a dip on the side of the track, among the trees. Fence wires loose around it hummed on the air. Jack stood on one foot for a long time. The engine pinged under the hood and metal scraped like fingernails. Unbreathing, he edged up to the ute. Its windscreen was white with starred glass and moonlight. He was glad he hadn't wished for a truck. The driver's door was open, but the passenger door closest to Jack was closed. The darkness in the cab was like the darkness in the hut. Just walk on, Jack, his nerves screamed. He got his fingers under the handle and lifted it. The door was downhill and a weight pushed from inside. The truck creaked. I could have wished for him to be alive, thought Jack. The door pulled free from his hand. His uncle must have been leaning against it for bloodied and staring, as if he'd had a far, far worse fright than Jack had. Davy Spicer's body fell limply sideways. Jack ran. <laughs> we were muted, but we're clapping. Thank you. Thank you. That was great. Oh, so someone said that the link to the KG to KGB wasn't working, I think. Oh, oh you mean the uh, donation link? Yeah, I think so. Bar yeah, or, or the bar? You said the KGB support link seems to be broken. Okay, so this link or this one? There's two different ones. I don't know. All right. Well, I, I can't look at it in a moment. I'll look at it. Um, right. Afterwards, but uh, yeah, that was great. So uh, we're gonna take a. Uh, a five minute break. Everybody's clapping and cheering in the comments. If you haven't seen that. <laughs> uh, Thank you gonna, all. <laughs> yeah. We're going to, we're going to take a, uh, a five minute break and we'll be back in five minutes with uh, mm -hmm. Shreta. So stick around. And uh, just a reminder, we're going to be doing a Q and a afterward. So if you have questions <laughs> for the guests, please think of them now. So we'll be right back. I'm going to mute everybody. So uh, you can get up if you want. Refresh the coffee. <laughs>
We'll just give everybody a minute to come back and uh, we did say five, but, uh, oh, I think you're still muted, Kathleen. Hold on. There we go. Um, great. So I should probably wait until yeah. the Q and A section, but I'm just curious, like when Ellen showed the book cover before Kathleen that there were some parts that were kind of, I don't know what it's called, gold foil or something. But Angela Sater's book cover? Angela's collection. Oh, yeah. Uh, Angela yes. Sater's collection. Yeah. Gold so like, it's copper, it's gorgeous. It's shiny. Like how does that, how do you do that? You just give them like a file and you say, okay, this color is going to be so, you know, gold. It, it varies a little bit. So with the American edition of Flyaway under the cover, there's foil and that's just based, I just had a flat black file, which could be printed as foil. For Angela's with the multiple tones, I actually ended up doing uh, a vector file, sort of tracing out the areas that I wanted to be in each color. Okay. And that way it could be translated into whatever whatever file the printer needs. Mm -hmm. And they overlaid that with the same art that is actually in that little box on the dust jacket. Right. So they enlarged that, printed that on the cover and then printed the foil Post over it. That's so cool. And on the postcard. So, so yes, just a, a vector file and based mm -hmm. on an ink drawing or, or a cut paper piece. Cool. 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 Yeah. I love it when people take things away and bring it back in foil. And if you look on the spine in that, they actually used my handwriting off the very start of my first sketchbook doing the illustrations I mean, for that book. Oh, my. Where it says, so along the spine. If hold on, hold on. <laughs> So that's actually oh, how fine is it, you know? is it this my way? handwriting along the spine in foil. And I was like, I'm only ever going to write things by hand and have it printed in foil in future. I can never go back to ordinary life after this. Oh, this is gorgeous. <laughs> this is really amazing. It's a lovely book. And it's it is the third of her sourdough bitterwood uh, trilogy of mosaic novels, short stories. Mm -hmm. And she won the World Fantasy Award for the second one. Wow. Okay. Lovely, lovely stories. Mm -hmm. Okay, so are we ready to go? Sure. Okay. Well, our next guest tonight is Shweta Thakwar, who is a fantasy writer and full-time believer in magic. Her work has appeared in a number of magazines and anthologies, included, including Enchanted Living, Uncanny Magazine, A Thousand Beginnings and Endings, and Toil and Trouble. Her debut young adult fantasy novel, Star Daughter, is out now, and her second novel will follow in 2022, and she's going to be reading from her novel. However, before, I forgot, I almost forgot, our, we have forthcoming readers. We have several months in advance, although we're not sure how long we'll be doing virtual versus in person. Uh, March 17th, we have Jeffrey Ford and Karen Warren, another person from Australia. Uh, April 21st, Nalo Hopkinson and Bruce McAllister. Um, May 19th, Angela Slater and Rebecca Roanhorse. Uh, June 16th, Nadja Bulkin and Seanan McGuire. And July 21st, Kim Stanley Robinson and Nancy Kress. And beyond that, we shall see. But please, everybody welcome Shva uh, Shveta. <laughs> Shveta. <laughs> Hello. Shveta. Hello. So, um, I think I have time to even read the little bit of, it's not quite a prologue, but I think I can fit that in too. So here goes. My mother is a star. I am half, half of the earth, half of the heavens. Cut me and I might bleed silver. My skin is a rich brown, the exact shade of my human father's skin, but my hair is long and thick and frosted like the moon. In my chest burns a fiery core that beats in time with the music of the spheres, their song deep and layered with dreams. My mother is a star, one of many bright jewels who sing praises in the skies, who view us from on high. She chose to come down and make a life on earth, but it wasn't long before she yearned to go home. Nothing could truly hold her here, not my father's proposal of marriage, not my birth into the world, not even our nightly dances together in the yard after devouring the dinner my father had cooked when we'd flee the sink full of dishes to spin and turn, washed in the light of her family above, our family. She watches me now from her old throne, one more twinkle in the constellation Pushya, 
a figure as distant as the characters in the bedtime stories she once loved to tell me. In the evening, I see her clearly, laughing with her companions, radiant. Sometimes I catch rare glimpses of her during the day, when the sky is blue and everything is warm and golden, and it's almost like having her with me again. Some nights, while the world slumbers, I raise my head to the cold, dark heavens and dream I can even speak to her. Yet I can't touch her anymore, can't go with her to the park, can't have her shop, take me shopping or hug me or scold me or just be in the same room with me. My mother is a star, so I can't do any of those things, not while she's in the sky and I'm down here. It always felt like a betrayal, but there was something I didn't see because I'd been looking at all the wrong parts, all the shadows between the stars. I didn't yet know how to find our light from Sheetal's journal. Chapter one, sometimes keeping secrets was the hardest thing in the world. Sheetal Mystery decided to make a break for it, right past the mirrored walls that reflected one another until the swanky banquet hall expanded into infinity, a horribly crowded infinity made of noisy kids, successful aunties and uncles, and gossiping grandparents, everyone watching, everyone talking and laughing. She waded into the mob. All around her, gorgeous clothes shimmered in rich colors, Ornate gold and gemstone jewelry glittered and gleamed, and a rainbow of syllables arced through the room. Without trying, she made out Gujarati, Hindi, Punjabi, Tamil, Telugu, and English, the heart of New Jersey's Desi community, all under one huge roof. Her cousin's birthday party should have been beautiful, like a glamorous scene from a fairy novel. Instead, it was all too loud, all too much. Maybe she could hide in the corridor. Mino would just have to forgive her for vanishing. She'd taken exactly two steps toward the exit when the bragging brigade, brigade, a group of the most annoying aunties and uncles ever, descended like hawks on their quarry. Hi, Sheetal, said an engineer uncle who started every conversation with the exact same question. How are your classes? Did you hear my wave of got early admittance to Harvard? And Beadil is a national merit scholar, an oncologist auntie announced. That will look so good on her college applications. Sheetal faked a grin. That's great. Summer vacation had just started, so she didn't have any classes. And anyway, this is all old news. Oh, why hadn't she kept running? The other uncle smiled at her. Your studies are going well? Still planning on a physics major like your papa? Actually, clown college is looking better every day, she thought almost shot back. She nodded inanely instead. What about your extracurriculars, oncologist auntie cut in. Now that you're a junior, have you thought about volunteering at the cl clinic like Beagle? You need to be well-rounded these days. Sorry, auntie, I was on my way to the bathroom, she still mumbled. She could feel their judgment clinging to her as she slipped past, sticky as a spider web. The kids they compared her to weren't any better than their show-off parents. Waybov and Beagle had everything she still didn't, and they knew it. Even now, they held court with their followers at the other end of the banquet hall, snubbing her every time she walked by. They'd written her off years ago after Radhika Foy had caught her in the pool at a community party and dragged her away in front of everyone. Chlorine in her hair dye didn't mix, as her auntie had pointedly reminded her later, and she'd overheard them making fun of her more, more than once for being shy and boring. She still wasn't shy. She definitely wasn't boring. Of course, she could never show them the truth. A soft, silver mel silvery melody pealed in her ears, stopping where, her, where she stood. She shivered, the seductive tones caressing her spine and making her palms tingle. Her blood heated as something kindled at her core. If light had a voice, this would be it. Star song. She already knew no one else could hear it, and not just because of the strident bass of the Bollywood hits pulsing through the restaurant like an erratic heartbeat. This was meant for her ears alone. At each note, her skin prickled in recognition. She forgot the party, forgot the annoying guests, forgot everything but a yearning to step outside and greet the late June night sky, to twirl under the endless open expanse of the stars. She would drink it all down in huge, thirsty gulps while their music washed over her and echoed within. Ring-clad brown samosa's fingers snapped in front of her face, followed by a crunchy samosa. Just like that, the vision evaporated, and Sheetal was back in the banquet hall. Her mouth watered at the scent of the samosa, all spice and fried dough, but the rest of her still ached for the lost star song. There you are! Mito looked amused beneath winged liner and blue-green eyeshadow, the same shade as her heavily beaded satin solar chemise. Your auntie just asked me if I'm signing up for that PSAT course with you. Does no one understand school let out two days ago? I heard it. Sheetal reached for the numinous feeling, for the way her veins had lit up, but it was gone. The song, you know, she gestured to the ceiling and opened doors at the back of the hall. It took Mino a second, but then she frowned. That song? Are you sure? I don't know. Sheetal took the samosa and bit into it. I, I mean, I think so. How long has it been? Trying to remember, Sheetal munched on the spicy potato and pea filling. Good question. Not since last summer? The sidereal melody had never been so loud before. If anything, she'd always had to focus to hear its strains. 
It already felt unreal, like the wisps of dreams left behind upon waking. She couldn't blame herself for imagining it, because honestly, who wouldn't want a distraction from Radhika Foy's family parties? As always, Dad's sister had invited everyone she knew, her, her neighbors, the stylist who started her eyebrows, even the mailman, like he was ever going to show up. Family, of course, had no choice but to stay the whole time. She still wiped her oily fingers with a napkin. Yeah, it probably wasn't anything. Admit it, Minol said lightly. The only song you really care about is Dave's. Maybe, she still laughed. Just thinking about Dave still made her gall all mushy inside like a toasted marshmallow. You're doing that dorky smile thing again, Minol said. She made a face. How are you two not sick of each other yet? The bass, the packed music abruptly shut off and Radhika Foy's voice boomed from the speakers. A microphone squealed, making everyone jump. And now, for your listening pleasure, a live number from Edison's own Kishore Kumar, Dave Merai. Dave Mirai, who was, for lack of a better word, really, really hot, with his longish hair and model's cheekbones. Dave Mirai, who'd only moved from Toronto at the beginning of sophomore year, but always had one girlfriend or another, until the Tuesday in March, he'd offered Sheetal a cordial cherry and asked if she read any web comics because he'd just finished a really good one. She knew people like Bujal and Weibo wondered what he saw in her, but as Dave winked at her from the stage, she couldn't care less. He grinned at the crowd, then stepped close to the mic and launched into a Hindi song from a classic movie. It was a little unnerving how much he really did sound like Kishore Kumar, one of the old-time icons of Bollywood music. His voice was rich and melancholy, perfect for romantic lyrics about despondent poets and doomed lovers. Sheetal closed her eyes and let herself slip into the song. God's his voice. It serenaded her, enfolding her until she started to warm like melt, melt like warm chocolate. She fought to keep her expression neutral in case dad was watching. Dikri, no boys until you're 35. Or, God's forbid, Radhika Foy. Bitta, I need to check his astrological chart and his family background, and they've sailed into the refrain. It felt like starlight. No, that was the astral melody trilling in her ears again, beckoning her to word other wor wishes, other worlds. Sheetal's grin wilted, so much for having imagined it. The star song was back. It was hard keeping secrets when yours was much bigger than anyone else's, with their latest crush or the tests they cheated on or the party they'd sneaked out to or the weed they'd furtively smoked in the park. When your secret was as vast as a constellation you couldn't help stare, but stare at every night before you went to sleep. Especially, she thought bitterly, her eyes opened now as the distant strains of star song grew louder when that secret was you. No one in the entire hall said a word, only listened to Dave and rapped. Even Mino looked impressed. They were probably all pretending he was singing right to them, that his gaze sweeping the crowd saw something special in them everyone else had missed. His eyes were almost dark enough to be black, and if Sheetal hadn't been trying so hard to ignore the star song, she might have thought silly things about falling into them, maybe even about kissing and the kisses and stealing some. But the starry melody remained, an undeniable undertone, and her thumb smarted where she'd ripped at the, at the cuticle. She had to get outside, had to find out what was going on. Even before Dave's last note had died away, the party exploded into applause and cheers and calls for an encore. He shook his head and hopped off the stage right into an adoring swarm of aunties and uncles. She still scanned the crowd, no sign of Radhika Foy or dad. If she kept her head down, she might actually make it out of here without anyone stopping her. Spice-laden aromas drifted toward them. Oh, good, food time, Minol said. Come on. But, she still began, just a second too late. A bangle-covered arm had grabbed hers and was towing her toward the buffet, where waiters had finished uncapping the steaming dishes. Even Dave's admirers were abandoning him to get in line. As Dave jogged up, Minol asked him, so how much did you hate that, having to sing on command like a trained parrot? He shrugged. I'm used to it. You know how showing us off is basically the Desi Parent Olympics. His voice turned falsetto with an Indian accent as he rolled his eyes, grinning at Sheetal. Oh, my son, he will be the next superstar. Embarrassing, but what are you going to do? But Sheetal didn't know. No one had ever shown her off. And with the astral song competing with the buzz of a hundred overlapping conversations and the thunk, thunk, thunk of the Bollywood bass, not to mention the thudding of her own heart, she couldn't concentrate. The walls felt like they were getting smaller or smaller, or maybe it was her throat. The playful words she might have said got trapped there on the way up. She widened her eyes in a way she hoped screamed for help, but Mino was too busy loading her plate with what had to be at least half the buffet to notice. Not knowing what else to do, she still started filling her own plate. You really are good, Mino told Dave, carrying her mountain of food to a nearby table. She grinned wickedly. I thought you were just boasting. Sheetal sat down too, staring at her meal of fluffy naan, vegetable biryani, alu matar, creamy dal makhani, and raita. She could still go chase down the star song, but now, with Dave watching, all Radhika Foy's old prohibitions strapped her to her chair as securely as a seatbelt. Always blend into the background. Never let anyone suspect what you are. You even have your own fan club, she teased instead. Dave dropped down next to her, his smile crooked. Sheetal's stomach turned a series of cartwheels, and every part of her was incredibly aware of his knee pressing against hers. 
some fan club. I can't even compete with the food. He found her hand under the table, driving all thoughts out of her head, all other thoughts out of her head. I bet they would have stayed if you'd gone up there. Yeah, right, she said, hoping he didn't notice how sweaty her palm was. She never should have told him she sang. You, though, we should put you on one of those so you think you can sing shows where everybody sucks except for like five people, and even then, three of them are just okay. Great, now she was babbling. Okay, enough. Mino leaned forward on her elbows. Save all that mutual admiration stuff for when I'm not around to barf everywhere. On to much more important things, like the great couch quest, which, by the way, I'm going to win. You just love funding my comic habit, don't you? Asked Dave. Out with it, Sheetal. What'd she say this time? He shot Mino a sidelong glance. I've got my eye on the new Kibuishi comic, you know. That's funny, said Mino, all glittering makeup and arch attitude, since you're going to be buying it for me. Normally, Sheetal would be giggling with them. Some people collected stamps or dolls, even cars. Radhika Foy collected couches. Well, sort of. She'd buy one, decided she hated it after a few days, and return it. And then she'd buy a new one. It was so predictable. Dave and Minnell had started laying bets on the reason why three months ago. But she still heard the high, sweet melody in her ears. Areas and enchantment. Beckoning. Beckoning. Well, Minnell pressed. It's too burgundy, isn't it? The last one was too blue, so it has to be. Dave's phone buzzed, and he pulled away to type a reply, leaving Sheetal's knee cold, lonely, and without something right here on earth to hold on to. Stupid phones. She poked him in the shoulder. Don't tell me you want to forfeit. He smiled in apology. Sorry, my cousin wanted to know how the song went. Mino struck her plate with a spoon, making it ring. Can we try focusing people, preferably before I get old and gray? Sheetal took her time scooping up a bite of alu maton and chewing the peas and highlighter yellow potatoes into paste. The real question is, would my foy be flattered or horrified to learn she has such devoted followers, the kind that place bets on her? Minol and Dave turned identical glares her way. Quit stalling, Shizu, Minol nudged her. I want to get some resmalai before everyone eats it all. Bad news, Minu, Shizu said with mock regret. Radhika Foy thought the color was fine. This week's impending return is because, and I quote, the leather gave me a headache with all its squeaking. Guess you'll just have to enjoy your rest malai with a nice dollop of disappointment. Dave pumped his fist, then held out his hand for Minol's money. She practically flung it into his palm. I'll think of you when I read, he offered, grinning hugely. The starry music sounded again, a command where before it had been an invitation. Dave's laugh fell away. Radhika Foy's warnings about staying off the radar faded. No matter how weird it looked, she still had to answer. Speaking of dessert, she blurted. I should find Dad. I'll be back. Dave nodded, obviously confused. Before Mino could say anything, she still bolted. Keeping close to the walls, she followed the insistent strains of song to the exit. What was happening? The music had come and gone over the years, but it had never demanded her attention like this, adamant as an unfed cat, and definitely not when she was in public. Sheetal, a familiar voice called, one that made Sheetal freeze. There you are, Beta. I was just thanking your papa for bringing the cake. Radhika Foy hastened down the hallway, a category three cyclone in a hot pink sari. It looks, she broke off in mid-sentence, her eyes widening. Before Sheetal could dodge, stubby fingers closed around her chin and yanked it down. She wanted to die. If Weibov or Bijal happened to be watching, they'd probably tell everyone at school she had lice. Her auntie clucked her disapproval. Dekuri, she whispered in Gujarati, your roots. Without pausing, she switched to English, as if that would somehow keep anyone who might walk by from understanding. Your roots are showing. What? Sheetal wrenched away even as her pulse sped up. Not possible. She just dyed her roots. Radhika Foy was being paranoid. She had to be. This is no laughing matter. Her auntie grabbed the dupata from around Sheetal's neck and tried to put it on her head instead. If anyone were to see, Sheetal barely evaded her. Radhika Foy, people are staring. Fine, her auntie snapped, draping the dupata back over Sheetal's shoulders. But you need to get your condition under control as soon as you get home. We have Manisha's engagement party this weekend. Sheetal nodded, two thoughts hammering through her mind. Had the die really not taken? And had anyone else seen? Oh, gods, had they seen? He kept talking about wanting to hear her sing and writing a song for her. He was way too close to her secret as it was. The secret that made her blood thrum in time with the heavens. Maybe she should tie on the dupata like a headscarf, even if it made her look like a village girl. If anyone saw, if they suspected. This is why, as her auntie always reminded her, she couldn't let herself be noticed at school. Why she could never give anyone a reason to look too closely. Why she, could nev why she would always have to hide. Even though part of her wanted to let it all show. Another guest came up to Radhika Foy, and she still seized the chance to duck into the restroom across the hall. She met her panicked reflection in the mirror and stared, and stared some more. It was impossible. She dyed her hair a deep, durable, normal black three nights ago, and yet tonight, right at her scalp, were the beginnings of roots. Shimmering, sparkling, defiantly silver roots. The fear she'd shoved down welled back up. What was she going to do if the dye didn't work anymore? 
White hair was one thing. Some people turned to bleach to get that look, but shimmering silver, not so much. Nobody's hair glowed. It was as if her hair were resisting being disguised. The silver voices swept over Sheetal again, stilling her thoughts. Her heart leaped in response. Like an invocation, the melody resounded within her, eerie and ethereal. Only a ceiling, at most a roof, separated her from her birthright. All she had to do was step outside, the music promised, and it would be hers. Her fingers grasped for phantom instruments, primed to dance over newly tuned strings. Her voice bubbled up in her throat, so close to cresting over her lips. Someone opened the restroom door. Sheetal, Mino called. The sound of her name, spoken over a flushing toilet, unwelcome as ice water, broke the spell, a brutal reminder of where Sheetal was and the room full of people just outside. She clamped her mouth shut. You never came back, Mino pointed out. Her eyes narrowed. It's the song again, isn't it? Instead of answering, Sheetal hugged her. I'm fine. Thanks for tucking on me. The final chords of the silvery song lingered on her tongue like a layer of frost, and she rushed to swallow them. They would have to wait. As much as it hurt, she would have to wait. She pressed her hands to her face, shutting everything out for the span of a couple of breaths. Then she rearranged her part to bury her pale roots, doused the light flickering at her core, and stepped out into the hallway, ready to play at being ordinary again. Just as normal and human as Radhika Foy and dad and the whole world expected her to be. Radhika Foy never talked about her sister-in-law, as though silence could scrub the memory from Sheetal's heart and, more importantly, from her DNA, her distasteful condition, as though what her auntie refused to accept didn't exist. But no matter how hard Sheetal tried to hide it, no matter how much Radhika Foy wanted to deny it, she would always be half a star. Always. And I love all your star jewelry. <laughs> Thank you. That was lovely. That was great. That's great. Um, so now is the time that we usually move into the Q&A portion of the evening. Um, so if you, if you guys watching us live have questions, please ask them in the live chat window. Kathleen, you look like you have a question. Can I do. Did you have like a mood board or a Pinterest board of catches? <laughs> catches I, was just, no. I was just gonna say, that sounds like me. <laughs> I hate every couch you ever buy. I buy a couch and after two years, I'm either bored with it or I hate it. Uh, well, I guess you would, I guess you would like Radhika Foy, Ellen. But no, actually what inspired this wasn't a couch. It was, um, so I, I used to take harp lessons and maybe at some point I will again. And one day my teacher told me that she had had a student who did this with harps. And I, and I just was like a serial harp buyer. Oh my goodness. How, like, how is that even a thing? It has to go in a book. And <laughs> yeah. That's awesome. Yeah. Um, so uh, I have a question for you um, about uh, Star Daughter, Shweta. Um, sure. Tell me about like, you seem to have uh, like family plays a large role in, in the book. Um, so uh, wh why is that, first of all? Well, in, I know in a lot of young adult, especially lately, the the idea is that the protagonist has to not have has to get away from family in order to have any kind of adventure and find themselves. But I think it actually complicates the story more interestingly to have the family around. Plus, in most cultures, honestly, family is a big part of, of your life, even if you don't necessarily want it to be, even if it feels overwhelming and and intrusive at sometimes at, at times. So for me, a, a, the whole plot of Star Daughter involves she's still having to go on a quest to find her star mother to to save her human father's life. So family was going to have to be part of it from from the beginning. Yeah, I mean, you you'd said an interesting point. Like a lot of YA separates the protagonist from their parents. So it, it's interesting. I, I like that where you know you're yeah. complicating things by keeping them with the parents, as, as I think many of us know uh, being with parents can sometimes be complicated. <laughs> to say the least. Um, Amy has a question. Kathleen, how does your art inform your writing? A good question. Uh, in, a, in a lot of ways. So clearly I, I'm an illustrator. I like to do things visually. A lot of notes that I took for Fly Away when I was working out the plot, I'd sketch parts to try and work out what I was doing with it. But then... <laughs> On the other hand, the writing also lets me do a type of art that I don't do. So I work with silhouette, I work with line, I do very flat colors and I enjoy working that way. But I love really painterly 
art. Mm -hmm. And so there's a lot of places in Flyaway where I go, oh, good, I, can, I can't paint like Tom Roberts, but I can use the light from a Tom Roberts painting in this scene. Or there's, there was a bit in the chapter I just read, I think where I talked about the, the colors sort of coming through from behind the trees mm -hmm. and just some principles of underpaintings. Like sometimes you'll see a lovely, you know, bleak, rainy day painting. And then you can see the artist has used hot pink as the base that they're painting on top of and it just glows through in parts. And I don't work that way myself. So in a way it's a chance to do the sort of art that I don't usually do when I'm illustrating. But also I wanted to specifically make it a very visual story as well. Uh, Chris Dykeman wants to know, is that dress one of your patterns? No, it's not, but thank you. I really like it. Okay. <laughs> I, I saw it on an ad on Instagram. <laughs> um, another question for Kathleen. Um, is Flyaway based on it real events or it, part of it, parts of it at all? The, not the story itself, but so many elements within it. And I know my mother left a message in the comments earlier, so she is always listening. She went through it on her second read and just flagged everything she recognised from our life out west. <laughs> so the section I just read, there are lots of elements in that that are, yeah. we had a little, there was a little sawmill about, well, not used anymore on a corner of land where our property was. And so we'd store boxes of old stuff there, boxes of photo albums and things. So a lot of that experience and the sense memories of being in there very much got into that chapter, mm -hmm. the gate. But I went out there after I'd been working on this chapter, I drove back out and was trying to remember how to get to the sawmill and drove out in my little car and <laughs> found the gate and climbed the fence and walked through the cypress pines and then started really freaking myself out because I'd written this chapter and the grass was cracking and the light was you know, gold. And I was listening to too many true crime podcasts at the time going, this is not a good idea, this is not a good idea. So they fared back into each other a little bit, but even the, the local town that only had a library on Tuesdays and everyone having Reader's Digest abridged books are all elements from out there. Against books, yeah. <coughs> um, I have a question for uh, Shweta. Um, you said uh, you were inspired by Neil Gaiman's Stardust. Um, were you nervous at all when you started writing this that maybe your book might be too similar? No, I... I felt, felt like I took Stardust as a launching point and then just ran off in another direction completely because I wanted to bring in uh, Hindu mythology. And as much as I love Stardust, Stardust, it didn't have that. So I knew that whatever I made was absolutely going to be my own creation, but a lovely homage, if you will, to Stardust. Cool. So, so um, I have a question for Kathleen. Um, do you write descriptions in the same way that you illustrate a scene? Um, to, an, to an extent, I think what I just touched on with the other question, that approaching it visually, uh, in the same way I illustrate a scene, I think it is actually a lot more atmospheric in writing than in art. In art, I am often being very chatty, trying to just communicate with line and with the writing I can slow down and really dwell on the quality of light or the texture of something or the way something both smells and and feels where with writing I'm trying to convey that in as few lines as possible. Um, Do we have have questions? Questions? Sorry go on Matt. Oh no I was gonna say like um, <coughs> I, I just I guess I'm I'm wondering uh, how the pandemic has affected your your creative work, if if at all. I mean, um, like, are you more creative? Are you less creative? Are, like, habits change. Like, like um, Shweta. Like, like, um, <laughs> am I putting you on the spot there? <laughs> well, I I thought maybe I spotted my editor in the in the audience. <laughs> <laughs> no, she knows. She knows. It's been it's been a struggle. Yeah. I've been working on <laughs> my second book for her, and uh, which is not a sequel, but is set in the same mythological universe, as it were. And it's been it's been a challenge. It's definitely been a challenge to tap into 
that that sense of making magic and yeah, it's definitely been a, a lot harder and it'll be really interesting to see once the pandemic finally passes, how long that will take for me to recover from. Mm -hmm. How about you, Kathleen? I, someone said near the beginning of all the lockdowns that they thought they were a stay at home person, but they're not, they're go wherever they want person. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and I think I felt a bit like that. I thought I worked at home, but I actually worked. I, in a lot of cafes <laughs> and suddenly all my all my working space got condensed and it got sort of just like a pile of work around me and usually I do a lot of projects and run from deadline to deadline real stagger from deadline to deadline but that was never an issue and then last year I was just I was just dropping the ball all over the place and couldn't and nothing seemed to matter deadlines and making stuff and getting it out there and keeping moving forward always mattered. And suddenly last year, it didn't really seem like that was possible or important in the scheme of things. So it took me a while to get that back. But I was teaching a course on creativity at the University of Queensland. And as a part of that, I was thinking a lot about how I worked and working on like sort of a journal process that my students could use that would actually hopefully be useful and they could adapt to what they did. And so it made me think a lot more all last year about how I worked, how I wrote, how I thought about pictures to how I thought about stories, what makes an idea spark for me, how I can, when, when I can keep working on a thing, what makes it a thing that I want to work on. So it's been really interesting year in terms of just thinking through and experimenting and playing with that, putting together some unexpected projects like the train poems, travelogues, all of that's been, I think it was a really valuable year in a lot of ways because I never stopped long enough to think about things before. We have a question from uh, Vashti Bandi uh, for both. <coughs> what was the most surprising thing you discovered about your story or yourself <laughs> while writing your book? Uh, Shweta, what, what about you? Uh, Kathleen, do you want to go first? <laughs> I'm just thinking, can I say this because my mother's listening in? Uh, you've got your editor, I've got my mother. Well, I've got my editor as well. Um, the I think for me it was, there are so many things in Flyaway that I, I wanted to make the world of it beautiful, but it's horrible things happen. And how much of that I could draw from good things that had happened to me, which was interesting. Like as a creative question for creepy things for the Gothic, taking something you like and that's quite innocuous or even nice and going, but what if it were evil is a lot of fun to write. So there are there's a character in this who my mother always said when we were growing up, trying to raise ladies all the time. And I was like, but what if that were a really bad thing though? <laughs> and yeah, it was just really interesting playing with a lot of that and those little twists and realizing the points where you're like, oh no, this was definitely a good thing. It's fun making it problematic. And then occasionally something you're like, wow, I I thought this was an okay thing. But now that I write it as problematic, I realize that it was. And I think a lot of the unawareness, ignorance, suppression of the local history of our area really came up when I was writing and editing this. It's like, oh wow, I can't not, even if it's a story about people not knowing histories, I can't ignore the histories that are there. So it was really interesting. I had a great childhood. Sorry, mother. <laughs> <laughs> yes. She didn't make uh, it your whole year, well, years of life. <laughs> I swear, oh, do you, do you, do you want to add anything there? Oh, sorry. Uh, well, see, I so I wrote star daughter and draft, redrafted it and revised it over six years. So that's why I was trying to think what had, what I discover about myself. Well, aside from how hard it is to write a book, uh, uh, I guess how important it is to, be to have have stories that are that have meaning in terms of relationships, but also are just fun. Because yeah. I didn't really ever get to see my a story that reflected me like that. That it had to have some kind of pain about being brown and, or or just it had to be a story about suffering and i really just wanted to put some light out there some some fun some magic just for magic's sake and that's i'm realizing more and more how important that's going to continue to be even if this, the things that i write obviously change as i as i go forward 
Um, food glory is food. What's that? <laughs> Can I talk about the food in my book? Um, right, right. Well, uh, yeah. let me I read it aloud food. for people who might be listening to the to the podcast when we uh, turn on the podcast. Uh, Victoria Jansen wants to know. Uh, Shweta, can you, Shweta, can you ask, uh, can you talk about the food in your book? How did the human food inform the fantastical food? Well, okay. First of all, I just, I love food. I love that has flavor. I obviously I love Indian food being of, you know, Indian origin. And I just, for me, food is magical, but it, the, the real world food, so to speak, didn't really inform the magical food that that's up in the starry court or that it's in the, the magical night market all that much. It was more, I just really had fun with what, if I were going to go to a magical night market or I were going to get, go to a starry court, what would be really just fun to shop for? What would be fun to eat? And I just really indulged myself and whatever whimsical thing came to mind, I put on the page, except for what I then had to pair back when my editor or when my agent was like, you, you know, you're having a little too much fun with this. You still got to keep the plot going. <laughs> I'm getting really hungry as I'm reading this. Good. <laughs> always a good thing, right? Um, the Stalking Horses, which is uh, Sarah, asks uh, both authors, was there anything you loved that you couldn't fit into the final draft of your book? The food. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there you go. Yeah. Uh, what, it, Kathleen? Oh, but I, I feel I tend to sort of feel the story at the page and not be specific about things. So I think a lot of the editing process was Ellen telling me to be more, you know, to put more things in and explain myself. Um, oh, I think every so often I, uh, I go back out or I look at something around me. I was like, oh gosh, I would have, I should have put that tree in the story. I should have put that the the spikes on the lemon bush lemon tree. If I I'm not sorry, to specifically they, mention they those. Want to do the um the you know the the family tree and stuff. I we should I should have I don't know why we took that out. Didn't we? Take oh, that, that, yeah, I forgot that was something that we took out. I, my only regret with taking that out because I hope it's clear enough in the story is that there was one line in there which was an homage to the cast of characters at the beginning of pick, the book of Picnic at Hanging Rock, which says here are all the characters in this book, it lists them all, and then at the end says and others who do not appear in this book, and I. <laughs> I still, it's one of my favorite things in one of my favorite books. I love that. So, but I don't think I carried it off quite as well as Joan Lindsay did. So I don't mind, but yes, that is something we had to, we took out in the end. Uh, anything else besides the, the food, Shweta, that you, <laughs> that you couldn't fit into the book? Yeah, some of the some of the really cool things that you can shop for at the night, at the magical night. <laughs> okay, you know, right. and, my, I mean, my agent was absolutely right, but I, I spent years making myself this magical night market. So I'm not going to be modest. I'm going to say it's the coolest night market ever because I, you know, it's, I spent years and years and years coming up with it and deciding what I would go shopping for there. And so, yes, when my agent said, you know, she still does have to kind of keep the story going. Like she's supposed to be here on her way to, to try to save her dad. And I was like, mm. well, you <laughs> okay. can have a short story in the, in that world. Right. And then, and then have the night market show up again. Or even just like just a chat book or a zine, which is a list of it, or which unfolds into a map of the night market. Yeah, oh, that would be very cool. cool. Yeah, you, you don't need to have a narrative. Have... And someone might illustrate it for well, you. Well, I was going to say. Well, I, I mean, I would absolutely love, as I told Kathleen the other day, I would love to have her illustrate something of mine one day. But, but if anybody is uh, curious, I do have an illustration of the night market on my website. So, cool. And what is that URL for people who? Um, shwetatakarar.com okay so you can you can all google that um so i don't see any more questions coming in well, do we, either of you have questions for the other <coughs> for each other I have, I have another one that i and i don't know if you have a specific thoughts on this Shweta, uh but something i keep thinking about and reading it in your story as well going the difference between food in magic food in fantasy and food that is magic and if you see a difference in the fun of writing between the two like food that can do something magical versus food that is just Ooh. part of magic yeah maybe just food 
Uh, I, I think food that does something is really, really cool. And who wouldn't want to have that in real life? And I'm trying so hard not to say what, because there is one more thing that I ended up cutting out of this that I'm hoping I can keep in, in the book I'm working on right now. But it relates to your question, and I can't answer it on camera, because, okay. <laughs> but I'll tell you later. How's that? Okay. <laughs> keep everyone waiting for that book. And and then another question for you as well. <laughs> There's that. Oh, I re it's really neat how uh, having the magic, not overlay, but literally above the story, then makes the ordinary itself heightened and magical in the story. And whether you found that was happening consciously, or whether you had to make the everyday even more everyday to set it off, or oh well. That's funny. So so Kathleen and I are both friends with an author you all might have heard of, Holly Black. And Holly's fairy books had actually really inspired me. I wanted to, to the way that she does contemporary fantasy, right? That you can, uh, that her books are set both here on earth, but also in fairy. And you could, uh, you could picture, if I just look right out of the corner of my eyes at the right time, I might be able to see that here too, where I live. So I wanted to do something similar to that. And that's funny that you ask because she pointed out too that I have details later in the book that are things like, you know, she said, you point out, you you compare something in the night market to like the color of grape jelly, or she throws her auntie, her Radhika Foy, that she has, you know, Tupperware that she sends up with Sheetal as if Sheetal's not going to eat up in the starry court. And <laughs> and she said, you know, do you, do, did you, do you see that that actually, what you were saying heightens the magic because you have more of the the real realistic elements too. And I said, yes, I actually did try to do that on purpose. Uh, the Tupperware less to be realistic but, or in that way, but more just because that's what a typical Indian auntie or mom would do. Like, we, you know, we have to feed you. I don't care if you're not hungry, you have to eat anyway kind of yeah. thing. But, but yes, I think that it, I've actually been thinking a lot about that in general, just in terms of, of craft. How do you get that sense of the numinous? I think you have to ground it in some sort of reality, especially if you're writing stories that take place at least partially in our world. And so you have to compare and control. <laughs> so I have characters taking Tupperware on an adventure as well. So. Well, good, great minds think alike. What can I say? Yeah. Clearly, it's what all, all contemporary fantasy requires. Tupperware is great. Yeah. <laughs> well, I have a question a for you too. Oh, go ahead, Matt. What? No, I said it's a whole genre, Tupperware pump. <laughs> <laughs> magic Tupperware. What would magic Tupperware? It would keep refilling with food. Yeah. yeah, like the tablecloth of fairy tales, the right? Yeah. Oh. <laughs> but yes, Kathleen, I have a question for you. So yeah. I was listening while you were reading. I was listening and thinking, and you might be able to tell from my chapter that I care very much about language. So I was listening to you or to your story and thinking, or your chapter and thinking. Yes, she definitely has an ear for language and and word choice. And do you? So when you're when you're crafting your prose. How do you like? How do you do it? Do you go back and layer it in, or does it just come to you as you write? A little bit of both. Mostly, though, when I'm writing, I try to just keep moving forward. So if I get stuck, I just describe trees until I get enough momentum to keep going forward. And also, I describe things by just putting in any, every adjective that occurs to me that might be appropriate. And then I know when I come back to edit, it's probably there. So that's one layer of it. The second layer is I really love poetry and poetic sentence structures and all of that and so it gets into my stories sometimes in the, like the most excessively baroque possible way the heart of alabas which is on tour.com that short story so many poetic sentence structures in there which makes it awful to edit because every time someone goes oh, you have to take this sentence or just to take this word out i'm like but i have to replace it with something that <laughs> is like has has to start with the same letter as a word in that sentence and then I'm up at two in the morning going who's awake no one in Australia and messaging Claire Cooney or someone going Claire Claire I need a word that means numinous but it can't have any n's or m's in it <laughs> so it's a lot of that and I, I like playing a lot of word games myself just trying to describe things as other things when you said the music like a cat being like a cat I love the idea of you know, sit down and go okay how many different ways can I describe music as being like a cat? Does, is it a music that feels furred? Does it spark with electric? Like, and just making lists of those so that, I guess, to sort of shake loose some of the more common constructions and make it more fun to do. And then, of course, when you're editing, you're like, oh, oh, I use this word, but what if I use this word that's slightly different and ties in? So it's kind of foreshadowing for something entirely unrelated to this scene later on. And I like having it there so that at least it, 
hopefully when you get to later in the book and a few things happen that are signaled in the adjectives in this chapter, that they feel deeper. But also if you reread it, there's a lot of clues there. And there are a couple, because it's been a while since I read this, there are a couple bits I'm reading. I'm like, oh, well, that was clever. <laughs> I did that. <laughs> I did that. That was that that relates to that other thing in you. So yeah, a lot of a lot of different approaches, but I do love language and the texture and the possibility of it. And especially because with the art, so much of what I'm trying to do is movement and motion and <laughs> communication. And I find I can actually slow down in the writing and just mm. play with that. But what about you? How do you play with the language? Well, unlike you, I'm not a visual artist, but I definitely see in, in my imagination. So I tried, I think of it, what you were saying is like painting with words, right? So I, and I, I think that language absolutely is not, it's not that it's a character exactly, but it absolutely can create the mood, evoke the mood that you want in for your story. And so same idea, I, I, the voice that I ended up developing over time became a very poetic one. And so for this book, especially, it was interesting because I was trying to figure out how to meld that with a modern contemporary American teenage voice as well. So I I definitely, I'm definitely one of those people who will hit up this, this thesaurus and see what all the possible options are and then find the one that sings and is and then and then I will be absolutely neurotic and go back and check like I read the entire uh, manuscript out loud when it was in copy edits to make sure that I did not use words over like even even if they were like far apart in the book and nobody else would ever notice I knew it would bug me so. <laughs> but that's really interesting about how it's like all of that thinking about words and then how you deal with it with the voice because I know there was all this vocabulary and visual reference that I wanted to use my main narrator who goes throughout the story wouldn't have had those experiences, wouldn't have looked at those books and wouldn't think that way or say it that way, at least at the beginning. So I was trying to go, how do I, how do I pull all of this in, in a first person voice of someone who has no interest in and no exposure to that? So it still gets across to the reader. And that limitation, I think, makes it so much more fun playing with the words. Harassing friends at two in the morning, go, help me, I need a vowel. <laughs> Um, so, um, I think we're getting close to the end, but if, if anybody has, uh, questions for the guests, please, uh, get them in now, but, uh, someone yeah. Got Yoda. yeah, someone, uh, Amy noticed my baby Yoda, <laughs> baby Yoda doll keeps me company. I don't have cool bookshelves that I can sit in front of like you guys. My book, I'd be sitting in the corner of my office and wouldn't be comfortable. Well, I don't have a baby Yoda, so. Yeah, I guess it's, you know, one or the other maybe. I don't know. Um, but. Uh, yes. no. I, I have another question. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Go ahead, please. Since I've got her right here. <laughs> I, I, I love how place shapes and changes the story. So the, the parts of the story that are in this world, how do you think they'd be different if it was set like a similar community, but in another city? Well, I mean, I picked the look, that's a, that's a great question because I picked it. The book is set in Edison, New Jersey, at least the parts that are on earth. And I did live there for a bit and there's a community called little India right there where they're and. up. Uh, it's basically what the name, what it says on the tin, right? That it's uh, grocery stores, clothing stores, jewelry stores, movie theaters, whatever, all, any Indian thing you want, you can probably get there. And so that definitely shaped, and I, I thought too about what, I didn't grow up there, but I was thinking about just what it was like for me growing up in the Indian American community and thinking uh, and and being at family parties and having because you know having people be really obnoxious about what you were doing and comparing their kids and uh, and so I think that it it basically had to be set there in Edison. I I don't really think it would have it could have worked elsewhere, but yeah, it just it had to be there in Edison. So. That's cool. And you know our our guest next week, Jeffrey Ford, used to live in in uh, Southern Jersey, and he wrote a yes, lot. Yes, I knew. Yes, yeah. he came to my writing group meeting one time and was really lovely. Years and years and years ago. Yeah, and a lot of his stories were uh, before he moved to Ohio. Took place in South Jersey, 
So very, very strong sense of place. Didn't he also grew up in Long Island. He's a clam man. Long grew up, I think I think it was either like Babylon or Smithtown. I no. forget which one. Yeah, he was. He, yeah. His stories really um, where he lives or lived really inform a lot of his fiction. He, the Pine Barrens in New Jersey. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. I love that in fantasy too, especially like growing up. So much fantasy is set in New York or London, but we don't live there. It's like, oh, it's magical because it's not like home. <laughs> and I love that specificity and how how enchanting it makes how enchanting it makes the story. I mean, this is just me, but I I wouldn't necessarily think that New Jersey was enchanting. But then when when I when you read like a Jeffrey Ford story, it, like he was able to just tease out all the really cool magical uh parts of that that i that I, I really liked something i loved in writing fly away i was using a lot of bird names that i remembered and there was one i started tracking down and could not find any evidence of it in any bird book in any collection of australian bird names all the regional varieties but everyone i knew had called it that growing up in this very specific geographical region and I kept, I'm like, it's fantasy. If people think I'm wrong, they can just think I made it up. Because one of the things I learned from reading Cold Comfort Farm is like, it's not even trying to be fantasy as such, although arguably it's science fiction. But she just made stuff up. She made up diseases of livestock and weeds. And I remember reading that book and going, oh, oh, you can just lie. That's <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, that's always like a sign of a, of, a, of, a, of a talented writer is when they're able to just lie through their teeth and you're like oh is this real Are there, is this uh, like is there something wait so did the bird exist was there a bird it did exist but and where i grew up everyone called it it was the, i think it was the chatterjacks everyone called them that but if you look in the all the big bird books it's not like and there'll be a list that they're called cwa birds as well which is um the Country Women's Association and 12 apostle birds and all of these other names mm -hmm. they gather in groups but it was, de like I've asked people, it was definitely what we called them, but it's a particular regional name that just had never been collected in any of those books. It was really, yeah, it was really neat getting to find that out. Amy Goldschlager says, I always loved how Rachel Pollock made Poughkeepsie magical in Unquenchable Fire. I mean, Poughkeepsie is kind of magical, at, at least in New York. Can <laughs> well, I've only been there a few times. Yeah, I mean, doesn't seem very like cool um, bridge that they they rebuilt. It was an old train bridge that now it's a walking bridge. But uh, I, remember, I remember the first time the first time I went to a place that I had read about in a fantasy novel was going to Sydney and the Rocks District, and I'd read a there's a time slip novel by Ruth Parks called um, Playing Beatty Bow, which is a I remember as a lovely book. I haven't read it for years. And going to a place that was mentioned in a book where people traveled through time was incredible. And then the first time I read a fantasy novel in, set in Brisbane, uh, Trent Jameson and then Angela Slater's books. And I was reading these books while I was going past the station or sitting in the food court where these magical things are happening. And I, I remember thinking, people in New York must feel like this all the time. <laughs> but that moment of finding the magic in somewhere that isn't where magic always happens is yeah. delightful. And the, and the thought that you could then maybe get it, find it too. Yes, but also that you can look around at the place, not just as oh, this is somewhere that isn't a big world city. It's no, this is somewhere where people live and have adventures just as much as a big world city. I don't know if this is specifically like a thing that, for people who live in larger cities, but do you guys ever have a real estate dream? That's what I call them where, you suddenly discover another room in your house. Always, yes. always. A house, it's always Maybe. a house behind my house. Yeah. yeah. It's, it's like it's the place crazy. where you live and then suddenly there's like, wait, I didn't know I had this extra room. I could totally yes. like, yes. I have a, and I it, I can see like a curry dream. I can see the, it's like that, it's like this big empty room with all these cabinets high up. These like old antique cabinets or not even or metal or something like a warehouse. I, I have a recurring dream of that. Yes, <laughs> yeah. mine's always a house behind the house. The block runs up at the back, and there's another house there, which is not terribly well kept. And it's always a Queenslander house with verandas, some of which aren't safe. I'm always like, why are why aren't I using this room? Like I I could put <laughs> stuff in there. Why is it just like storage? <laughs> 
Yeah. It's a portal so back. Next to me, he's like, no, you can't use that room. And then I have the uh, the other real estate dream is I can't find my apartment. I can't find my house. I mean, I, yeah. I live on a block of row houses, and I can't get in the front. I can't find the front door. I have to surround some place behind. So it's like I guess two. I don't know what that's about. Usually my dreams are pretty surface, and I understand what they're what's going on. But those are the two recurring dreams I have. I don't know. That should be for like the the Jungian analysis podcast or something. <laughs> analysis and yeah. What's your What's your hidden room like, Shred? <laughs> A portal, of course. <laughs> just, just step into it and disappear. Yeah. That, that's that would that's if I dream stuff, it's like that. So. Mm -hmm. Well. Um, I haven't seen any new questions in a little while. So um, unless you guys have any questions for each other, um, I guess this would be a good time to, to wrap up. Um, so yeah, this was great. So uh, tonight's guests, uh, we had Shweta Thakrar and Kathleen Jennings. Um, you guys are both awesome. We loved having you. Uh, Thank you. you. Great. Uh, buy their books. The links are in the YouTube description. I'm going to uh, check all the links to make sure they all work. Yeah. You can throw them up on screen. I'm going to do one even better. I'm going to do this. And then I'm going to do this. Yeah. I'm just getting excited because I, I have like new <laughs> new graphics I can throw up on. <laughs> there we go. And then that's the uh, Kathleen has the Australian cover too, which is yes. different, but also. I'm going to hear the yapping dog next door. <laughs> I, I, I don't hear it now. That stopped, but if you, the Australians have some extra art on the inside cover flaps. Oh, oh very cool! In exchange for not getting gold foil. Yeah. <laughs> well, that's uh, a fair trade, I guess. Thank you both, and uh, and uh, thank you to uh, everyone who tuned in, and um, See you next thank month. you to the folks who donated. Uh, we got a very large donation. I will thank them afterward in email. Uh, but, th uh, yeah, we really appreciate the support. Um, it's been a whole year. It's crazy. I can't believe it's I been a year. Believe it's been a year. I know it's, it's uh, just, and we don't, we don't know how long, you know, right now we're booked, what was it, through August, July. Yeah. Uh, virtually. And, um, I, in a few weeks we'll decide what to do about August. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It depends, it depends on how, how everything's going, but uh, it's too early to go back. Yeah, it might be. We'll see. Um, but yeah, uh, thank you guys so much. This was great. And, um, we're going to end the broadcast, but, uh, Kathleen and Shweta hang around. We're going to hang around in the green room for a little bit to do a, a wrap up, but, uh, yeah, um, this was great. So we'll, uh, we'll see you guys, uh, next month with, uh, Karen Warren and Jeffrey Ford. So, uh, have a good night. Good night. Good night. <laughs>